think we're going to have a revival that doesn't cost us anything, we're going to miss it. There's going to be work in revival. There's going to have to be love in revival. There's going to have to be strength in revival. But Revelation 12 gives us a picture of a woman who is travailing. And she's about to give birth. And just about the time as you read through those scriptures, you begin to get the picture that this is a vision of a woman about to give birth. What else do we see? We also see a great dragon. Because the dragon is there. And the dragon is waiting. And when that birth happens, the dragon is going to step in and he's going to kill it. That's what the enemy wants to do to our end time revival. The dragon was there waiting to devour the baby. Satan knows that there's a revival coming, so he wants to kill the revival before it's born. And I'll tell you, nothing can kill a revival like jealousy among the people of God. Nothing can kill a revival like a lack of unity. Nothing can kill a revival like hatred and anger and problems and backbiting and envy. Nothing can stop revival like those things can stop revival. we got to fight the dragon here today. We're not going to fight him with a sword. We're going to fight him by loving. We're not even going to face the dragon. We're just going to hug each other. We're not even going to address the dragon. We're just going to love each other. Somebody's going to go home today. You're going to fix some issues in your family. Someone's going to go back to your church. And there's a church member that you wounded, you hurt. You're going to go fix it today. Because having revival and going to heaven is more important than harboring anger and envy in our heart. As I begin to bring this to a close, in Luke chapter 15, we see three parables in one chapter. And sometimes we get so much in a rush to get to what the chapter is saying, we miss the setting and we miss the occasion. But before Jesus gives the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost boy, make a special note that all of these parables were a response to the church world hating each other. Because in verse 1 of Luke 15, the Bible says that then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners to hear him. And when Jesus started spending time with the publicans and the sinners, the Pharisees got upset. The Pharisees became jealous. They began to question the will of God. They begin to question the plan. They begin to question why he is interjecting himself. And here it is. Jesus is trying to win. He's trying to teach and he's trying to minister. And who is it rising up? Was it the Roman soldiers? No. It was the church. It was the Pharisees. Definition of a Pharisee is one who lacks large heartedness. Lacks brotherly kindness. The Pharisees lacked appreciation and admiration for other men. Always vaunting themselves in everything. Taking no pleasure in hearing other men praise for talents or performance. Taking no pleasure in the conduct or the character of others. A Pharisee delights in backbiters. A Pharisee is a partaker with busybodies. A Pharisee is someone who hates to see his brother blessed. We spend a lot of time in the church protect, projecting bad characters on other people. But sometimes we can be a Pharisee. Sometimes we can take on that spirit. And all of the things that the Pharisees were angry about Jesus was because he spent too much time with those who needed him. They were astonished at his doctrine. The Pharisees had a problem because Jesus began to serve. He began to minister. He began to love. And he began to spend time with the people that they were not willing to spend time with. And it hurt their credibility. They didn't want to see 
seen Jesus blessed. The first time a crowd showed up to hear Jesus preach, they got angry. See, today what I'm preaching about is a necessary praise. And a necessary praise is this. When God blesses your brother, will you damn and condemn it? Or will you rejoice with them in the revival? That's a necessary prayer. We can clap, we can shout, we can run all we want to. But God's not really going to be pleased until we can praise and love and honor each other just like we're honoring Him. He gets all the glory. He's above everything. But He wants His church to come together. Luke 15, the Pharisees are angry at Jesus because he's ministering, he's loving people, he's, he's spending time with people. And rather than answer their angriness, he says, let me tell you a story. He says, uh, you know, a guy had a hundred sheep. He was counting them one afternoon, he realized one of those sheep was lost. It was only one percent. And some other shepherd might have said, well, that's an acceptable loss, but not this shepherd. Not our shepherd. He brings the 99 to safety, and he goes out in search of the 1%. The one lost one. Oh, can somebody hear what I'm saying right now? If you're in the 99, be thankful that you've got a shepherd that will go look for the one. It bothers me that I don't see Titus. What we heard today? Where's Titus at? That shepherd went looking for the one. The lady's counting her coins. He tells another story. She counts her coins and she's supposed to have ten. But one is gone. That's just ten percent. And she lays the nine to the side. And she begins to turn the house upside down to find the lost one. And Jesus begins to tell them these stories. And he said, when the shepherd found the lost sheep, he threw it over his neck. And he went home rejoicing. But when he got home rejoicing, he said, it's not good enough that I just rejoice by myself. But he called all his friends over. So let's make merry because I found that one lost sheep and he invited everybody in. I don't know what the expense was. I don't know what the cost was. But when he found the lost one, he said, let's have a time of excitement. Let's have a party. Let's shout and let's rejoice. Oh, because one lost. Hallelujah. That's the lost sheep of Israel. That's the lost outside there. We need to win that lost. That lady finally found that one coin. That coin was a part of a dowry. And I don't have time to get into that. But what the simplicity of it was is it was either all or none. It wasn't complete without the one. The 90% was never going to be sufficient. It had to be all of it. we got to have churches that are willing to go the extra mile to win the 1%, going to go the extra mile to win the 10%. It doesn't matter if it's the minority. It doesn't matter if it's an ethnic group. It doesn't matter what their nationality is. It, they may not have 50,000 in our city, but if there's just one Jamaican, if there's just one Sikh, if there's just one that'll come to church, we've got to reach that one. If it's just 1%, we've got to reach them. If it's just 10%, we've got to reach them. And when we reach them, just like the lady and just like the shepherd, she said, oh, I've got all together now. I'm 100% again. Let's have a party. Let's rejoice. Let's be excited. Let's gather together. All my friends, come over and let's rejoice. I'm sure those Pharisees were standing around scratching their heads thinking, well, yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Oh, but Jesus wasn't done yet. He had given them two left jabs. And they were seeing that right hook coming out of nowhere. Because the next story 
went a little different than the first two. And I, the way I'm going to share it today might come a little different as well. But he says a father had two sons. One of those sons became lost. We're not talking about 1% anymore. We're not talking about 10% anymore. Now we're talking about 50%. A father had two sons and he lost one of them. And you know the story. He went away. He took the inheritance. He, he wasted it on riots. He's living. He, he squandered it all. Flushed it all away. Then the famine came. And then he was lost. And then he finally came to himself. And he, he's coming back home. When he comes home, the story is so beautiful. And we oftentimes idolize the father because he's waiting for the son. And I love that. I don't disagree with that. The, the father's just out there on the highway. He's out there searching. He's looking. He's ready for the son to come home. He's not whole. He's lost half. I've got my, my other son. I, I'm never going to be happy until my other son comes. And when the son comes home, he says, kill the fatted calf. Put the ring on the finger, the robe on his back. Let's have a party. They begin to make merry and be glad. Everybody's coming in for the party. Just like the coin party. Just like the sheep party. Now we got a son party. And then, oh, they're all coming together. And they're all being excited. But the difference in this third story identifies the spirit of the Pharisee. Because when the shepherd called his friends... They all came and rejoiced. And when the woman called her friends, they all came and rejoiced. But when the father called everybody to come and celebrate the returned son, not everybody came. That one son was just out there by himself. He knew there was a party going on. He heard about it, but he wasn't going to dirty his hands with it. He was just by himself. They were separated, these three. Father and two sons. The spirit of the Pharisee is identified because the older son, he never left, he never lied, he never lost nothing. But he stayed with a bad attitude. And his attitude had gotten so bad that he could not join himself together. He could not celebrate in another's victory. He could not become excited about the revival and the reconciliation. We are not going to have an end time revival without a revival of backslide. You may not believe this, but I believe in my heart that every single soul who is a backslider, it's not the Lord keeping them away from church. Because whether we believe it or not, there are moments that every backslider has where they feel conviction. And they feel deep loss by being disconnected from God. Yeah. And they feel deep hurt by being disconnected from the church. Yeah. But it isn't God that stops them. Yeah. It isn't God that keeps them from coming home. Yeah. It's because when reality settles in, they realize there's, a, there's an older brother. There's somebody who may not celebrate. There's somebody who may not get excited. There's someone who may not have joy. And here we are, the Filipino Evangelism Conference. We want to have great revival. But the Lord is speaking to us saying, the only way we're going to have the revival that God wants to bring on this earth is we have to have a revival in our love 